Hi, and welcome to How to Go Independent, episode 12. Buying and selling a practice is a big topic in our business these days for a number of reasons. Uh, Succession planning for advisors who are nearing retirement age is a big deal. And for those of us that are still in growth mode, looking to acquire a practice or a book is often of interest. A lot of the advisors I talk to in the network that I help manage as well as elsewhere you know, are looking for businesses to buy potentially, but they don't necessarily know how to go about it or what that could mean. And since most advisors don't have experience doing that, and I've been able to complete two transactions in the last several years, uh, as well as participate in one uh, in, a, in a partnership with my advisor support business, I thought I'd talk a little bit about that topic today. In particular, I want to focus this solo discussion on how and why buying a book or a practice can improve your life, not just your business. So I'll talk about four, four reasons I think it's a great thing to improve your, your quality of life and also some considerations on you know, what you need to look for and be careful of before you get too deep into to the process. Uh, this will probably end up being one of a series because the process of buying a practice and running it and, and everything that goes from the initial discussions with a potential seller to completing a deal and working with your new clients and the seller's former clients. That's a pretty involved process. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts. There are a lot of great resources out there, but I will probably do some future episodes on the ins and outs of that and the different things to consider, as well as have some guests on who have done it and so you can hear their perspective as well. Um, but today I want to focus on, you know, kind of the why. Why might it help or and how can it help your, your life? Uh, first, let me give you a brief background on my experience. So I've had two practices that I've acquired, uh, both relatively small or at least small relative to my my practice at the time. And I think that's a, that's an important thing to the success so far of those is generally it's easier for an advisor to absorb a practice that's smaller than their own. A rule of thumb I hear sometimes is you might want to acquire something about a half the size of your own book because it's just more manageable that way. If you think about that, if you have 10 clients and you acquire 50 new ones, that's going to be, you know, a, a very different practice you're going to be looking at it might you might not have the capacity to do that uh, without a lot of change so in my case that was fairly true um, when I started the discussions with both advisors they both happened to be women um, and importantly I knew them well before we had any re any detailed discussions about the about me buying them out and in particular um, you know we worked together for for a period of time so the first one, uh, I had known her at when I started in the business. Uh, I linked up with her again when I was considering going independent. She was affiliated with the uh, the independent broker dealer I'm I'm now affiliated with through our hybrid RIA. And so I called her among others to say, hey, "How do you like it there? Tell me about it." So that was helpful. And then we started kind of keeping in touch. And when I moved, uh, we ended up working together. I was her. Um, this is part of how I built the network was people I already knew. So we had initial discussions about a three to five year time horizon. And I started to meet some of her clients very, you know, just casually or on the surface level introductions. And at towards about two and a half years into that, she said, okay, at the end of this year, I think I'm ready. So, you know, we, we had a very, gradual and, and fairly smooth three-year process of increasingly meeting her clients and at the end of the third year we had come to an agreement and it was it's worked out well so the, um, I rec I'm recording this in early 2016 both of these um, deals were completed about three years ago so I have a little bit of time in the rear view mirror to be able to talk about the success of, of each of them so main point there is I had known known her the seller for 
several years, but had worked together in some capacity for three years. So it was, it was very smooth. I'd met clients and, you know, it wasn't a big shock. And I got to see kind of how she did things, you know, day to day. Uh, the other deal was actually closed about the, it closed the same time just by coincidence. So also about three years ago that it was finalized. Uh, the seller had joined our, or my network at the time before I, I had a partners in that business. And so we had worked together for about a year before we started having the conversations. Um, the first seller was, um, nearing not quite retirement age but sort of ready to be uh phasing out uh being solo it can be it can be tough and you know i think increasingly the compliance burdens administrative work of this business if you don't if you don't have the scale to add some staff it can kind of be draining so that's i think what drove her to be considering that plus her husband had been in the same field for a long time and he he would be retiring in the next few years so that was obviously a, a a huge part of her decision was kind of the life plan. She had her first first grandchild uh, shortly after she retired, I believe. So you know, life factors are a lot as much or more important than the business factors as they should be. Um, the second seller, she had been in the business a long time and actually remained in the business. She just was, I think, wanted to kind of downsize the the amount of stuff she had to keep up with and um, was a little more interested in. Well, I'll go into the I'll go into the details of sort of how we structured each of those at another point because again I think this can be uh, a fairly in depth process. So the key point is I knew both sellers and um, added together these were both fairly small practices. You know, again everything's relative, but they were meaningful to me, especially combined. So uh, the year this these both hit, um, you know it it significantly increase my top line revenue. So, um, that's kind of where I come from three years looking back of, of buying two practices that were meaningful to me, um, both from sellers that I, that I knew in one case very well. And in another case, uh, fairly well, because I was working with her, uh, or at least around her business f- for over a year, um, beforehand. So that's, that's the background. So let me go into the, th- the, the first, four main reasons I think it, this can really improve your both your business and your quality of life. Uh, the first reason is probably the most obvious that a lot of us are interested in, which is the, it's it's a direct route to business growth. You can add a lot of assets under management and 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 or clients in one fell swoop. So, you know, not to belabor the point, but it. it it's a pretty straightforward route and you're not usually going to have a hundred percent retention. Although sometimes if you, if you get referrals or you have clients that decide to add, you know, add money to their relationship after you get to know them, you know, theoretically you, you, I hear of deals that have more than a hundred, hundred percent retention. Um, but you know, let most people that I talk to and hear of and read of, if you have a fairly well thought out, uh, tra- transition, especially if it's at the same firm, the, the clients do not have to move anything, you know, start all over with a new custodian, new broker dealer. And both of these, by the way, were at my, uh, the same firm. So there was no repapering necessary on the client's part, which very, very helpful. And I like that lack of friction personally, but, um, again, a lot of these things I'll touch on in future episodes. So business growth and client growth is, is huge. And that was the case in both of these scenarios for me. I have not retained every single client. There's various reasons stuff happens. People have relatives or close friends that are there or people that were were kind of their backup plan. And um, maybe they didn't want to let go of their previous advisor because they had a good relationship, but they didn't have any allegiance to me. But by and large, it's been very significant retention. So it's, it's worked well for me. So business growth is, again, Top line revenue is, is a great reason um, to consider buying a practice. And one of the reasons it can improve your lifestyle is if you can get sort of to some sort of critical mass or next plateau of your business, you can reinvest in more or better staff. 
So that's one big difference in my business now compared to, you know, three, three and a half years ago is I have now more dedicated uh, resources, mainly staff. So I have more people to help me get done what we need to because it, it just makes sense given where the business is and I can more easily justify the investment of people. And again, that to me has been sort of a, a great benefit, especially for a lot of people like, like that are where I was, where you, you know, you probably should have some help, but there's no, you know, you don't need a full-time person and certainly can't justify the expense the ability to, to kind of get over that hurdle and, and invest in uh, someone from a, from a either full time or, you know, half time, you know, fairly significant amount of time dedicated to helping you. It, it can really help your, both your bottom line and sort of your quality of life from my perspective. So that was the, the first, first reason is top line growth. Uh, the second reason that I find has been a great, benefit from a quality of life standpoint is if you choose your seller correctly and you get along with them and sort of see eye to eye and and have some sort of connection like I did with both of of these sellers, uh, if you're able to do that, the clients you are now working with will tend to be somewhat similar to your seller, have similar uh, approach to life, uh, things that are important, disposition, personality, um, values. That's not always the case, but I notice, um, a lot of advisors, it makes sense. We're in a people business, very personal business. Your best clients often end up to be people you like, I hope, and vice versa. They like you. So all of us tend to attract and retain clients. I think that are somewhat similar to to ourselves. So, you know, if you're adding a bunch of new clients at once, it's helpful if, they all or many of them are going to be the kinds of people you're going to enjoy working with. So if you, if you choose a seller correctly, and again, I think that's a, again, another for another episode about how to go about determining if you have a fit, but if you find it, this is a big deal. It's been helpful to me. The clients that I now work have worked with for, for three or four years, they, I like them and they seem to like me. Um, and that's a, it's just a huge quality of life issue. I think this has been hit home for me with the with the addition of a lot of clients at, at one time, uh, as you have when you acquire two practices at, at kind of the same time. I thought it, I was worried about it overwhelming me, and, and I did add some some help right at that time or shortly thereafter from a staffing perspective. But it's it's nowhere near as overwhelming if you enjoy talking to the people that you're working with and helping. So uh, I think that's a quality of life issue as much as a business issue. We can, we can always, you know, if you're going to add clients, you can add people that you don't enjoy working with that grade on you when you you have to interact with them and that might generate revenue, but it might decrease your quality of life. Uh, And that's where I think if you're going to have an independent practice and you've, you've gone through the hard work of, building the foundation of a business this isn't always an easy business to build uh in our industry if you can get through that i think life's too short to kind of have to be beaten up all the time or you know not enjoy what you're doing so again second reason i think this buying a practice can help improve your life is you can develop a lot of new relationships that are enjoyable because the clients you your new clients will be a lot like your seller if you do it right. Uh, the third reason is that I find it it allowed me to be more selective with who I continue to work with. And what I mean by that is as I've gone along, and this might be unique if you have another business or you're really trying to kind of streamline your your business into more of what what you might call lifestyle practice where you're you're not trying to maximize income. You're trying to maximize enjoyment, you know, make a good income, but also, you know, have a very high quality of life and manage your, manage your commitment so that you're not having to work 45, 50 hours a week. You can do all the things you want with your family, um, you know, have a fairly low stress environment. Um, so maybe that's, that 
situation, or in my case, where I was helping build an advisor support network. So I wanted to make sure and continue to make sure I'm working with clients that I really think I can do a good job for. I'm excited to help. I'm, I'm, I really enjoy helping them feel more comfortable about their money. I want to work with people who I enjoy working with and seem to appreciate, you know, the value that, um, of working with me. So when you have more, uh, clients as, as your business grows, I found it's easier to, um, not be so, um, tied to or committed to relationships that aren't really relationships or they're not, they don't seem to be kind of your ideal client. So what I mean by that is let's say you have, um, a hundred clients and you know, if you're, if you're like most people, as you've built the business, you that you've somehow ended up working with some people who probably don't value you as much as your best clients do. Uh, so maybe, you know, maybe 80 of those clients you really, really enjoy and 20 of them, if they had decided to work with someone else, it wouldn't, it wouldn't bother you. And, and maybe in a couple of cases you'd be relieved or ecstatic. That's, you know, that's nothing against those people. It's not that you don't like them. It's just, you know, fit is a big deal in a personal business like ours. So if you have a hundred clients, uh, most of us, when we're earlier in our career, it's hard to, it's hard to let go. And even if we do want to let go, if they're nice people, um, but maybe just not a good business fit, you know, it's, it's a, it's an awkward and difficult thing to either say, Hey, I don't want to work with you anymore. Or even if, if you do a better job, find other advisors that are happy to, and eager to serve. Uh, maybe they're newer in the business. Maybe they, they don't really have any hard and fast, uh, goals on on who they want to work with or they're just happy to add clients um so if you can if you can get to the point of finding a way to get those people help it can really relieve some stress and and lighten your um kind of the the pressure off working with people you don't enjoy or you don't think are a good fit or just taking up time and other resources so my point is if you have just kind of the a practice that a lot of us evolve to, it's hard to do that. Uh, sometimes for me, I know I knocked on doors meeting people. And so if people have, I've worked with them a long time, I'm not really excited about just handing them off and say, okay, well, you know, how, good luck. However, to, to my point here, when you've acquired a practice, um, one of the one of the interesting dynamics is you don't have this investment personally in an ongoing relationship yourself. Now the seller may you have to be real smart and careful about how you go about this or think this through. Um, but my point is, what the one thing I've noticed is, if I acquire a practice and you know a few months in or after a meeting or two, it seems to be evident that this person or family isn't really going to value what I'm doing or may not be a fit from a, you know, kind of ideal client standpoint, not just from an asset level, but also from a uh, personality values approach, you know, all, all sorts of factors. It's a lot easier to say, you know what, I think I have another, a better way to help you. And it's, you know, this advisor is going to help you or this team or, you know, I'm, I guess I'm lucky to have developed that uh, sort of a, I have some options, you know, to, to have kind of connect people that um, where it's a win-win and I'm not just dumping them on the street. And again, I, I think most of us probably overestimate uh, we're, we're all replaceable. So even our best clients, you know, usually they're our best clients because they they're attractive so they can find other help certainly they enjoy working with us hopefully but you know we're all replaceable in particular if someone doesn't have a ton of money um you know they're if we're not going to give them the right attention there's probably someone else who's more eager to do that so uh, anyways if you don't have the long-standing relationship with a, a client it's a little bit easier to say, you know what, I think I've got a, I can help you a different way. So it's, it's, um, it's easier to break up with someone, you know, after two dates than, than after a long marriage, let's put it that way. Um, so, and what I've, what I noticed after the first couple of times I was able to 
So you know what? I, th- I think I can make a connection and, and kind of help help another team or advisor and hopefully help a client get better attention than I would give them is you, again, especially if you take that approach where you're trying to help people not just slough them off because you want to. I think you can then, can, it helps you evolve and refine your the way you look at your business so that you want to balance the needs of your business with your own personal needs um, to make sure you're not hanging on to relationships just because you think someone will be upset if you say, hey, I'd like you to meet so-and-so. I think he's a good fit. He's, he's going to be helping helping me or help, you know, whatever whatever the situation is. It's a lot easier to go through that with someone that you've known for a while if you've been able to sort of practice and had that come up with people that you, you don't have a longstanding relationship with. So I guess it's sort of an indirect benefit, but I've seen it work for me that um, it's helped me tighten up my focus on kind of who I'm looking to serve and work with on a long ongoing basis. Cause let's face it. We all, we all, we all only have so much capacity, time, energy, attention. And even if you add staff again, any one of us can only serve so many clients effectively, or at least the way I, I, I would hope to, to work with people in a fairly in-depth depth manner uh, where I'm going to get to know them pretty well. And you know, there's just, there's an upper limit to that. So, um, kind of being able to meet all your new clients over time and get a sense of, you know, who fits right in. And hopefully that should be most people if you've done the, the deal correctly. Uh, but you might have people, it's obvious, you know what, this is, this is not a good fit uh, going forward. I probably wouldn't have added this client if I, if I hadn't bought this practice. And again, you also want to talk to your seller about this at some point and make sure they don't, they're not having any any heartache or heartburn about particular particular clients or in general. Uh, and again, some of this will bleed over into other episodes on, you know, what, what's it like to buy a business and what does that mean and, and things you have to think about. But So that's the third reason. It allows you to be more selective in who you continue to work with. And it, uh, if you continue to add mostly good and ideal clients and you are careful not to keep too many less than ideal clients are for you know long term uh, I've seen the quality of my business increase because I'm continuing to add to sort of the the best relationships and either add no more or reduce the number of less than ideal relationships and it's a very in my case it's been very you know slow over time but it gets me excited about the future of my business because I've realized it's a choice who I work with I get to decide that I'm not I don't have to work with everybody and I can't. So, um, and not that everybody wants to work with me, but it's a really liberating feeling to get to a point where you realize, you know, I can choose who I work with. And I guess this is related to buying a practice because when you have more, you know, more revenue on the top line and more clients to sort of choose and draft, if you, if you had that hundred client practice and now you have 150, well, maybe you only need um, to keep the top 125. So, and that might be, you know, in that hypothetical, the 25 people you or, or clients you help find other options, many, many of those may be from the acquired practice, but some of them might be folks you've realized that probably, you know, it's not a, a great, the ones you get stressed out when they call you or you, you dread meeting with them for some reason. Um, so anyways, when you have more to choose from, it's like anything in life. You have that abundance mentality of, I don't need every single one of these. I can I can let go of the ones where there's not the best fit and, and people aren't getting value or don't feel like they're getting value. So that was number three. Number four, uh, I think going through this process really helps you Again, continue to evaluate your practice as a business because you're you you're seeing what the seller has done, but it also makes you evaluate and consider your long term plan with your business. Uh, even if you're a ways off from from retiring, or you don't ever plan to retire, and I'm in at least one of those categories, probably the first one, and who knows, maybe the second. But it's it's a little early for me to be 
deciding which of those makes sense, but it really, since you're there, if you're thinking about the seller's perspective, what they're doing, you can really take some lessons learned um, and apply that to how you how you think about your business going forward. So what I've taken is this idea that I just mentioned that if you only have, you know, your sort of your best clients or your best is a, is probably too broad. You only have clients you enjoy working with. Um, if you can continue to, to, to work on that concept over time, your practice, I think becomes more and more valuable because if you've done this sort of, um, auditing of your of your practice your book to only sort of the the nicest people with the the outlook that kind of matches yours and maybe in general have a higher asset base than some of the people you decide to to uh, help help get help get help elsewhere you're going to have a valuable practice so i mean just think about if you had uh you know 200 accounts 200 clients and you know you do the analysis and you know if you have that 80 20 rule going on your top 40 or 50 clients are going to make up a lot of your revenue if if that part of your practice was to go to market by itself you carve that off it's going to get a higher valuation than the bottom 30 or 40 percent just the way it way it works because that's who you know acquire typically is going to want to work with so um I'm a ways off, a long ways off from selling my practice or, you know, or looking at it as a lifestyle, you know, just kind of hiring people to help me with it. As If I get to an age where I don't want to spend 40 hours a week working or, or more, it, it really, I don't think it's ever too early to start to think about what your business looks like and the quality of it, not just for you, but for a potential acquirer uh, or, you know, more from a estate planning and, and preparation for me and my family. If something happens to me, I want it to be easy to manage, relatively speaking. If I'm not here, if something happens to me today, I want who, the people that are going to be paying my my wife, I want them to have a practice that's reasonable, reasonably um, easy to manage, um, people that are easy to deal with. So, again, it's it's allowed me to look at my practice in a new way. And I've always enjoyed the business side of our uh, of our industry. I know a lot of advisors that's not they don't enjoy that. I guess that's one reason I'm independent and, and I'm doing this podcast. But these are not really complex ideas. They're just you have to think about them if you're gonna if you're going to um, you know improve the kind of the quality of your of your business. So, like a lot of things, if you end up developing a practice that's easy to manage and run it's more valuable not just to you but then if and when you ever want to sell it um but basically the idea and this is expressed in the e-myth which is a pretty famous small business book you want to build your business so it can run without you in that book that's the premise even if you never want to sell it because it just allows you to be more systematic and more profitable while you're still running it so I, i'd say the same thing goes here even if you have no plans to ever sell your business um the process that you end up going through if you've bought uh, bought another book from some from someone you you end up looking at your own at least i have and kind of looking at what what does that mean for me in the long term and and, and again i think that's a very valuable exercise so those are four things of why buying a, another practice could help improve your quality of life one is the top line revenue growth and growth in clients uh, to the fact that you can, you know, these number of clients you're going to be adding are often going to be very similar to your seller. So you'll have a kind of a, uh, a tight shot group, if you will, of profiles and how people, you know, work. Uh, number three, it allows you to be more selective with you know, who you add to your practice or keep in your practice as clients over the long run. And number four, it makes you think about your own sort of long-term business planning, both from a succession and continuity contingency plan. So those are uh, four good reasons why why I think it's it's been valuable to me. Um, now, I do have a few things, sort of the, well, that's all great, but what can go wrong or what do you need to consider? So 
I, I have four issues or points there as well. The first one is it's a big commitment. Um, you are sort of putting a lot of time and energy into a relationship with one person, and that's the seller. So I often, again, this is probably a, could be a, a good and a bad thing. It's been great for me, but you just have to be aware that you're kind of hitching your wagon, so to speak, to one person. And for example, if you have a $50 million practice and you go buy a $25 million practice, you know, $25 million practice is nothing huge in the big scheme of things. But I looked at it like I'm adding a $25 million client because I need to keep the seller happy with what's going on. So we'd all love to add a $25 million client if we have a $50, $50 million practice. But that's a big risk. It's, and it takes a lot of attention. They're going to, when they call, you're going to answer, you know, if they want to meet at a time that's not as convenient, you're going to have to consider. So, so that's another reason, again, as I, if I record another episode about what to look for as you're looking for a practice to buy, you know, I think personality fit and how, you know, that's, do you like this person? Do you, do they respect what, you, what you do? Um, that's a huge deal because, that can fix or make this commitment issue not 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 a problem but that's something to consider i guess is my main main point that it's it's a big commitment and if the seller ends up not being all in in terms of promoting you and helping you making the introductions kind of pumping you up to the to their clients and who will be your clients that could really make a deal not work nearly as well as it it should and could um, in both of my cases, it's been great. Uh, I couldn't ask for a better relationship with with either, um, but it's something you got to consider. Uh, number two is another sort of an obvious issue. You know, the a cons- you know downside of buying a practice it costs money. <laughs> so all the top line revenue growth I talked about that's going to be offset either with a you know, per, just a flat out cash purchase, which doesn't happen all the time, very often, but sometimes on smaller practices, that's the case, or a, a financing structure that's going to cost you money. Uh, in one of my two deals, um, I paid fairly quickly, and the other one I'm paying over five years. So in this, in that scenario, I'm I'm three about three years into a five year payment plan, and it's been great. But I am looking forward to the day when that's when I've you know I've paid it off, and then you know all the cash flow from that acquired business will will stay stay with me. But it costs money. So, in an ideal world, if you could go out and and develop a marketing plan that would yield, in in that hypothetical example, just go find twenty five million dollars of new clients, uh, you're probably going to spend less money, invest less money, with your marketing than you would with buying a practice. Um, but the good thing about the buying a practice is it's a known quantity or mostly known, whereas obviously unless you really build a great system, marketing is not always uh, a direct, it's hard to measure at all you know, unless you have a really good system developed, which most of us don't, unfortunately. Uh, so number two, it, it's going to cost you money. It's, you know, and that's typically going to, you know, if you're, if you're investing cash, it might only take you two to two and a half years to get that money back. So it's really not much of a payback period. Uh, but even still, that's, you know, that's time you're, you're not earning a net profit um, or, or any more net income. So something to consider. And again, all this goes back to probably the biggest decision is making sure you, you have a good relationship or can develop a good relationship with the seller and, and that you trust them. Uh, third thing to consider is, kind of the flip side of, of what I talked about in managing my own business, the seller probably didn't, uh, they probably didn't walk away or be, or were selling the business because it was running perfectly without them, which obviously I'm talking about fairly small businesses that don't have, in my cases, didn't have any staff. So that was actually probably a good thing from a reasons they wanted to sell if you can get to a point where you have the right staff in place, it's pretty easy to, to stick around and, and manage your workload. So why do you need to sell? Um, 
but I guess my what I, the point I want to make is these advisors, the seller is selling for a reason. So usually, it, you know, if, if you can identify that reason, that's that's helpful. Uh, in fact, I'd say that's a red flag. If you can't identify a reason for them to sell, that t- if the seller tells you how great the business is, how easy it is to run, how much money they make, yet they're eager to sell uh, for no apparent reason, you know, if they're not if they're not of retirement age and um, need to make sure you understand the seller's motivations pretty well. But in general, if they're selling, you know, they're not going to have the perfect practice. Not that there is a perfect practice, but that's just something to consider is just like when you're buying any investment, you know, if something looks too good to be true, just make sure you're verifying that it's not. And um, whether that's a stock or real estate or, you know, whatever, whatever you're buying or investing your time and energy in. That could go for uh, probably a lot of personal relationships, but I won't I won't go into that um, that realm at least not today. So, and the last reason is the seller is very unlikely to have done everything in their business just like you did. So, you're going to add a bunch of new clients, which is a commitment, and you're probably going to have to get used to the idea that you know if you add a new client from a from a someone that's disgruntled with their advisor from another firm, you can say, yeah, they, they, that guy, that girl, that, that gal, they didn't know what they were doing. Let's do this. You can tear up their portfolio and no problem. That's probably what the client wants to see really. However, if you're taking over this relationship from someone you're paying and you presumably have sort of chosen that, yes, I'm, I'm willing to, 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 to do a deal with this person I, I like and or trust them enough to, to go through with it, you've got to, if they have portfolios or approaches or philosophies or, you know, on any particular fact or niche or idea that are different than yours, you have to be very careful about how you uh, explain why your approach is your approach. I was going to say why it's better, but even if it's not better, if it's just different, um, you know, you use mutual funds instead of ETFs. You use ETFs instead of mutual funds. You like uh, large cap U.S. stocks versus the same things in an ETF. You know, you like to buy uh, bonds, uh, individual bonds versus bond funds. Whatever the whatever the way you do things is, um, just be real smart about how you think about that when you're looking at, at, a, at buying a business and you need to make sure the seller sort of is okay with the idea that you might do things slightly differently. Uh, you probably need to have a philosophical fit overall, making sure if hopefully you're trying to take care of your clients and do the best job you can. And, and hopefully you feel like the seller was, is, and was too, but that's a very broad, uh, statement and can be there's a lot of ways to take care of your clients the best way you think possible so just something to consider that you're going to have to navigate a little bit of either running things in parallel until you can get people comfortable with you or say this is the way we're going to do things and run the risk that some percentage of people will not like the upsetting the apple cart of having a new advisor and a new strategy now again you can figure that out as you talk to your potential seller you know do their clients just kind of do whatever they recommend or are they more, do they like to be more involved? That's something you can look for um, as you're potentially looking to buy a business. So those are the four things to consider. One, it's a big commitment to one person, your seller, who's going to have influence on, on their clients who will become your clients. So just be, be cognizant of that. Number two, it costs money. So you're going to have a, a guaranteed outflow with, with sort of an, an unknown exact inflow and, and benefit. Although I will say most deals, if you do them right, they're going to be great investments for, for your business in the long run. But again, you're going to have an outflow. Um, so all your top line growth doesn't fall to the bottom line immediately. Number three, your seller is probably selling for a reason. So just kind of try to be looking for why those are and make sure they make sense. So, um, make sure you're not buying a lemon, so to speak. And number four, the seller probably doesn't do things exactly like you did. So just be be try to be flexible and think that through and, and the different ways that you can you can work around that. 
Well, I hope this has been helpful. Uh, a little background of some ways that I some ways I think of buying a practice can really improve your, your business and your quality of life, and also some things to think about. Uh, as I think about the topic of buying and selling a practice, in, in, in particular buying, um, although selling is a natural related topic, uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, these things, and doing it, and um, I think we'll have future episodes about more of the ins and outs, but this, these are just sort of, hey, what's the... What's all the excitement about? Why should you even consider it? And how can it improve your your life? So it's definitely done that for me. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to email me, Sean at NDFA, or um, track us down on Facebook or Twitter or anywhere else you can find how to go independent. And thanks for listening. Until next time, we'll see you later.